that generation, the Jews that Jesus was speaking to, did seem, see an end to the world as they knew it. For them, everything changed. For them, heaven and earth did pass away. Because for them, heaven is that place where where we enter into communion with God. It was that meeting place where heaven embraces earth and that was in the Holy of Holies on Mount Zion in the temple. It was the only place they could offer worship. And it was destroyed in the year 70 A.D along with the world as they knew it, that surrounded that heavenly meeting place, as just Jerusalem was destroyed and leveled, burned. They saw the end of an age. And we see the ushering in of a new age. And while Jesus was speaking about this ending that was coming, we know that His words go much deeper when we hear these these words of challenge, these uh, words of the apocalypse, we might find ourselves becoming fearful. The prophet prophet Daniel reminds us that it will be a time unsurpassed in distress. The gospel, a time of tribulation, a time of darkness when even the powers of heaven will be shaken. How scared should we be? Well, whether we are petrified or filled with joy depends on one thing and one thing alone our relationship with Christ, our commitment to the way, the truth, and the life, our relationship with the one who was made flesh in our midst, the Son of God, the Savior of the world. It all depends on that relationship and our commitment to Him. We can make it about other things. We can deceive ourselves, lie to ourselves. And say, it doesn't matter what you believe. As long as you believe something. And yet we know in the back of our minds that Jesus made it very clear. No one comes to the Father except through me. We can say that it doesn't matter that Christianity is fractured into a a thousand pieces. More churches that being added every day, each proclaiming a variation of the gospel, different truths. Even though Jesus prayed that we be one, as he was one with the Father. Even though he established an apostolic church on Peter, the rock. So that we might not be divided. We can say it doesn't matter. We can say and deceive ourselves and say that what we do with our lives, the choices we make, make no difference whatsoever. Even though the greatest gift we have been given is our free will. That the only way to truly love is to be truly free. That we have the same choice that Moses held out to the people. Choose between life or death. We could pretend to ourselves that because we have such a loving God. And we do. That it doesn't matter. But then would not the weeds and the wheat continue to grow together? 
Would not the battle between selflessness and selfishness continue? Would there not still be those who objectify, step upon, use, and walk away from their brothers and sisters? No. It boils down to one thing and one thing alone. My relationship with Christ, my commitment to the truth. The great news is this. Jesus gives us everything. Everything that we will ever need to live with him forever. He gives that to us in the sacraments and in the church that he has established. He gives us the great gift of baptism that we remind ourselves of every time we come into our church and we dip our hands in that holy water, that it's through the waters of baptism that we are born again, that we become heirs to the kingdom, that we participate in his dying and rising. He gives us the sacrament of confirmation to strengthen us with an outpouring of his spirit that you and I might live as heroic saints of God. And then holding nothing back, he gives us the very gift of his presence in the Holy Eucharist. That even now, you and I, we might walk in a communion with the Lord that we can say with St. Paul, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives within me. That we can experience even now the life of blessed union with God. And when we face hardships and illness, he gives us the sacrament of the anointing of the sick so that we may be strengthened in our darkest hours in mind, body, and spirit. That even when we face the difficulties of illness, we may be witnesses of the light And when we get lost on life's journey, when we find ourselves distant from the Lord, when we find ourselves dead inside, He gives us the sacrament of reconciliation so that He Himself can minister to us and heal our souls, restoring the life and the grace of our baptism so that we might continue to live our lives according to our baptismal promises. Do you forget what those are? They're in the catechism. And then he gives us two beautiful sacraments, vocational sacraments. The sacrament of, of holy matrimony. So that in the flesh, as we witness the lives of husbands and wives who lay down their lives for each other, we may witness the very life of the triune God in our midst. For God is not alone. God is a communion of life and love that is fruitful. They make present that mystery, that beauty. And the order of the sacrament of holy orders. So that in our pilgrim way, through this journey through our life, that he himself may minister to us through his priests. He gives us everything that we could possibly need so that we might not be alone, so that even now we could experience the breaking forth of the kingdom of God in our midst, so that even now we may have the beatific vision, that even now we would not be afraid for our communion with God begins here in this holy place. Today's readings, these apple... I can't say the word today. Apocalyptic literature. It either challenges us to get on the way, to say goodbye to our former ways of life and enter the new life that comes in Christ. But if we are on that way, these readings should inspire us in our missionary zeal to invite others to be part of this place, to be part of the life of grace that comes in his church through the sacrament. And so I'm going to give you a simple, practical way that you can make that possible. I'm going to ask you this week to imagine in your mind, to think in your mind about someone that should be sitting beside you, 
here in this space today. To think about someone that you want to stand by you, to be with you in the kingdom forever. Maybe it's more than one person. This week I invite you to give me their names and their addresses and I will send a letter of invitation that they join us in two weeks as we begin a new liturgical year together, as we enter into the mysteries of our salvation. Let us invite them back. A recent study has shown that so many of our brothers and sisters who no longer attend with us, who have found themselves distant from the church, no longer practicing, So many of them are simply waiting for an invitation to come back. Let's do that. Give me their names and addresses and I will write a gentle letter of invitation that they may be one with us. And I'm going to say the word again just to get it down. These apocalyptic passages that speak of the end times should not cause us fear. We who have been so blessed, we who gather in this holy place where heaven meets earth, embraces earth, here in this holy place where he makes his presence so visible and tangible for us, here in this place of mercy where God welcomes us back, here in this place of blessing, We should not be afraid. For the blessings begin here. Let us invite others to join us.